I would like to continue our series, as Pastor Kath mentioned a moment ago, that we started last week called Prayer's Perspective. Everyone say Prayer's Perspective. I started this series last week. It's just a a bit of a mini series and a reminder of the importance of prayer. But we started last week by talking about a painting that was done by Filippino Lippi. And he did this painting in the 15th century. And for many, many years after that, the art critics complained that the painting that he did, all the proportions were wrong. And it wasn't until many years later that one particular art critic by the name of Robert Cumming noted that this painting was never meant to be hung in an art gallery. He realised it was painted as an aid to prayer. And it was meant to be viewed from the kneeling position. And it wasn't until Robert Cumming dropped to his knees and looked up at the painting that the perspective shifted and everything came into line. Much like we see at the football or at the cricket, when you see the logos live, they're all elongated, but they were never meant to be viewed when you were there at the ground. They were meant to be viewed on television. And so it was with this painting. It was meant to be viewed from the kneeling position because when you look up to God, it changes our perspective. Prayer changes our perspective on things. I think we often go wrong when we have our own perspective on circumstances and situations, which we're all guilty of, but we're meant to bring those perspectives and we're meant to give them to God and get a fresh perspective. And I trust and pray that through this two-week series, we'll have a fresh perspective again on the importance and the power of prayer. We looked at that last week in Psalm 37, uh, 30, sorry, 32 verse 7, where David writes, You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. David wrote this after committing adultery with Bathsheba. He messed, out, he messed up royally. He messed up really badly. And yet he found God to be his hiding place. The question we looked at last week is, where do you go to hide when you mess up? Adam and Eve went behind a bush. We see that Adam would walk and talk in the cool of the evening with God. But the moment he messed up, he went into hiding. And I dare say all of us have a place we go to when we are in trouble where we hide. And God wants that hiding place to be in Him. If you're struggling, if you've messed up, if you've done the wrong thing, then don't run to other things like we tend to do. We run to work. Many of us just get busy doing things. You know, I love my wife, but when she's in that place, she just gets into cleaning the house. I mean, if our house smells like domestos, I can promise you we have been having an argument. If it smells overly clean, if it it smells cleaner than a house should smell, we're fighting. (laughs) I I, I tend to do the same. I just just bury myself in work. I just get busy. That's why I tend to hide. Doesn't make it right, but it's good to know where you go. And God wants us not to go to these things. Some of us just go to the place of comfort. Some of us just go to the place of pleasure. Some go to suppressants, some go to stimulants. What's your thing? It's easy to judge someone for their alcoholic addiction or their drug addiction when we're addicted to comfort or we're addicted to pleasure or we're addicted to work. All of these things are keeping us from the right hiding space and place. God wants us to hide and rest in Him. That's what He wants. And today, if we've been reminded of nothing else through this two-week series, I trust and pray that we will get God as our hiding place again. We looked at Psalm 139. This raw, real, very bold and audacious prayer of David's that God would search His heart in three particular areas. The first one was that God would search His heart that God would search His head. He says, if there are any anxious ways in me. Do you know you can be anxious about something without necessarily suffering from anxiety? Can I say, don't let the world put a label on how you're feeling. 
those anxious thoughts, and we all have them, then let's take them to God. God, search my head. See if there's any anxious way in me. And then thirdly, He says, search my hurts. He says, search me. See if there's any offensive way in me. Most of us don't like to think of ourselves as ever being offended, but we do, we get offended. And David got offended. And he said, God, search my offences, search my hurts. As I said last week, we tend to accuse people and yet excuse ourselves. Not so with David. And then he says, be my help. Lord, lead me in the way everlasting. I love that thought. Do you know help is one of the most common prayers noted in the Bible? It's a prayer you can pray every day, on every occasion, in every situation. You might need help today with your broken relationships. You might need help today with your struggle with sin. You might need help today with healing in your body. Whatever help you need, we can go to God. We can rest in the hiding place that is our God Almighty in prayer. Some of you say, I know that. The question is, what are we doing with what we know? And I trust and pray that we'll be reminded of what we need to do today. Today, my subtitle of my message is simply this, first response. Everyone say first response. response. See, prayer should be our first response, not our last resort. And again, I think if we're honest, many of us use prayer as a last resort. We try everything else. We talk to everyone else. And then when something's not working, something's not happening, then we go to God. Like Kath mentioned a little bit earlier, we try to add God at the end and thankfully He is there to be found. But God wants to be at the beginning of our journey. He wants to be at the beginning of our decisions, the beginning of our situations. Yes, thank God for His grace. No matter how messed up your life might be, no matter how messed up your circumstance might be, God will meet you in that place. Amen. But man, wouldn't it be better if we had God at the beginning, before things just got so messy? before we got in the, final, the financial mess. And again, if that is you, there is grace. But I tell you, God wants to do the whole of our lives together in every area. And so today's message is designed to serve as a reminder that prayer is a privilege and therefore should be a priority. Prayer is a privilege and therefore it should be a priority. Why? Because prayer is not something we do. It's someone we talk to. I'll say that again. It's not something we do. It's someone we talk to. It's not something that we do. It's someone that we get the incredible privilege to talk to. I don't know about you, but it amazes me that the God of the universe wants to talk to me. And not only that, He wants to hear from me. He wants to talk to me and He wants me to talk to Him. You would think with all that He's got on His plate, running this crazy earth, He would be too busy to speak to me and too busy for me to speak to Him. And yet that's what makes God, God, is that He's not too busy. He longs to have relationship with me as He longs to have relationship with you. And He wants to have a relation with us collectively and individually. We serve an amazing God. Amen. Amen. And so I want to read from the book of Acts, Acts chapter 16 this morning and draw some thoughts from this story and then we're done. How's that sound? But Acts chapter 16 is an amazing passage of Scripture and I want to pick it up in verse 16. It says, Once when they were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these are men, uh, sorry, these men are servants of the Most High, God, and they're telling us the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. I mean, man, think about that. 
These men are servants of the Most High God and they're showing us the way to be saved. These men are servants of the Most High God and they're showing us the way to be saved. Not once, not twice, but day after day after day after day. Paul gets a bit of a bad rip that he's just this grumpy old man that didn't have a lot of time for people. He put up with this young girl for days. These servants are men of the Most High God and they're showing us the way to be saved. It's like, oh my gosh. And after many days, it says, finally, Paul came, became so annoyed, understatement, yeah. that he turned around and said to the Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the Spirit left her. This story goes on. It's an incredible account of something that took place in the life of Paul's ministry. This young demonised girl gets set free. You would think that would be happy days. But unfortunately, that's not the case. When this young girl got set free, all hell broke loose. See, she was a slave girl, which meant she had owners. And because of the spirit that was not only on her life, but in her life, she was able to predict the future. And when you own a slave girl that's able to predict the future, that's a good money spinner. And she earned her owners a lot of money because of this gift. And so when this gift had been taken off her or driven out of her, the owners were now ticked. And they took Paul and Silas to the authorities. And then not only did they take them to the authorities, but they got the whole crowd on side and they had Paul and Silas beaten, flogged and imprisoned. They didn't get a fair trial and they found themselves in jail and they found themselves worshipping God. And all of a sudden, there was this earthquake, all the prison doors flung wide open. The jailer, the man who was on duty that night, sees all the doors have been open and he thinks, oh my goodness me, everyone's escaped. And so what does he wanna do? He wants to kill himself. Just put yourself in his shoes for a minute. You've got one job, look after the prisoners. P.S. It's a pretty easy job because they're all locked away. It's like easy money. And all of a sudden he kind of, imagine he wakes up, all the doors are open, everyone's escaped. And so he goes to kill himself. And Paul, with the doors wide open, hasn't left the cell, still in stocks, still in chains, back lacerated, says, hey, don't, don't kill yourself. Even that. I mean, how many of us would even think to say that. Many of us would say, serves yourself right, but not Paul. He says, don't kill yourself. The jailer undoes the chains, falls at their feet, says, I'm a sinner. They lead this man to Christ. He bathes their wounds, gets to meet the whole family. The whole family gets saved. Crazy story, amazing story. You've heard it preached on many, many times before and I've preached it a number of times. Love this passage of Scripture. But can I take you back to the beginning? Because we often get caught up in all that jail time and the, the uh, you know, people, they were singing and praising God and, and God starts tapping His foot to the music and the praise and all of a sudden the, the earthquake happens and all the rest of it. Had a lot of fun with that side of it. But this whole story started because two men, were on their way to pray. Yeah. Yeah. That's where this started. Yeah. Two men said, let's go and pray. And as a result, they got distracted. They were committed to prayer. Can, can I just put this as an aside and hopefully it will help you. They were committed to prayer and I find the best way to commit to prayer is to have a time, yeah. a place, and a person. Paul and Silas at a certain time went to a certain place. Yeah. What to do to pray. That's powerful. Yeah. 
In Acts chapter 3, we see James, uh, Peter and John at three o'clock went to a place to pray. Time, place and person. Before we started this church, I used to pray with my brother for many years. It was me and Pete at his place, 5.30 to 6.30 every morning. Time, place, person. I have a time, a place and a person to this very day. This morning, when many of you were in bed, I went for a walk with my wife to pray. 5.30, we went for a six kilometre walk with my wife to pray. It's what we do. If you are struggling to pray, I would say have a place. Have a time and find a person. Who's your person? Where's your place? And what's the time? Oh, Tony, I can, I can hear what you're saying, but you can pray anytime. You can, but do you? You can and you should. And I have more times that I pray other than just that. But it's just a great yeah. commitment. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. What, what I love about having a person is they keep you accountable. Because let's be honest, I don't always feel like praying. And there's many times I used to run around my brother's house all those years ago thinking, I, I better go because he'll be up there ready to pray. I don't want to pray, but you know what? I, I got to go because he's waiting for me. What I didn't know is he didn't want to pray that morning either. But he got up because he said, oh, Tony's going to be coming around here, bright eyed, bushy tailed, ready to pray. So he gets up. And there's two people who got out of bed that day, both not wanting to pray, but got up to pray because of that guy who was going to come and pray with them. Yeah. Yeah. For Kath and I, we love to go for a walk. Do you know why we go for a walk? Because if Kath and I decide to pray in bed, do you know what's going to happen? <laughs> One of two things. We'll leave it there. But we're not going to do much praying. That's all I'm saying. So we, we get up and we go for a walk. Because the two things we might be doing in the bedroom, you can't do in public. That's all I'm going to say. And so we get up and we walk. And, it, and it's amazing. Do you know, we actually walk a, a, a marathon every week just in our prayer time. Six kilometres a day for seven days a week. It's 42 kilometres. That's a marathon apparently. It's not our goal to do that, but it's just what happens. But that walking keeps us fit, yes, but it keeps us awake. Because I don't know about you, how many times is your best intention, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray all night. I said, just try and pray for five minutes. And even five minutes, to stay awake for five minutes is tough when you're praying. Because the devil doesn't want us praying. He wants to distract us. These men were on their way to pray. And this demonised young girl distracts them. The devil wants to stop you praying. He hates the fact that we can talk to God. He hates it. And if you, if you ask yourself, why does he hate it so much? It's because he knows the power of prayer. He knows the benefits of prayer. So he'll try and distract us. How many times have you said, I'm gonna pray and you fall asleep? You weren't tired. If you chose to do a hundred other things, you wouldn't have fallen asleep. But when you choose to pray, you feel tired. That's not just a natural tiredness. Yeah. We have an enemy who wants to stop us praying. Yeah. Have, you, have you ever tried to pray and, and all of a sudden you're ready to pray and all of a sudden there's emergencies. Yeah. Emergencies that probably wouldn't happen if you didn't want to pray. You know, sometimes Kath and I can be going for our prayer walk, just being very honest and raw and vulnerable with you. We have all the intents of the praying, but just before we pray, we just talk about what we want to pray about. We talk about some of the things we're facing and all of a sudden what we're talking about, the things we're facing, it triggers a thought and then Kath gets upset and then I get upset with her and we find ourselves arguing. And we're walking along the beach arguing when we went out to pray. And I remember many times I say, can, can, do you even know what we're arguing about right now? 
And she goes, I don't know what we're arguing about. Have you ever been in that moment? And you have to ask yourself, why do we do that? Why does that happen? It's because we have a very real enemy that knows the power of prayer. He actually knows the power of prayer more than many Christians know the power of prayer. And he wants to stop it. He wants to hinder it. So can I say, find a person, find a place, find a time, and don't allow the distractions to stop you praying. This whole story in Acts chapter 16 starts with two guys who were on their way to pray and all hell broke loose. If all hell breaks loose, when you make a decision off the back of this series to start praying, almost expect it, but don't let it stop you praying. Are you with me? Because prayer is an act of worship. Prayer is important. It's more than just bringing a wish list to Him. So prayer should be our first response because of these four things I want to highlight this morning. There's many others, but for the sake of time, here's four things to remind us of why prayer should be our first response. First is because prayer acknowledges God's existence. Prayer acknowledges the existence of God. It acknowledges that there is someone more ultimate than you. The reason we pray is emphasised in the first four words in the Bible. Genesis 1, chapter 1 says, In the beginning, God. Where were you in the beginning? Where was your problem in the beginning? Where was your circumstance in the beginning? Where was your perspective in the beginning? It wasn't. What was in the beginning was God. You know, I love going to the gym. Many of you who know me know that. And I go to a great gym. One of the slogans on the wall is believe in yourself. And while I understand the intent behind that slogan, it's such a small slogan. To believe in yourself is such a small thing to believe in. We need to lift our eyes and get our eyes off of ourselves. One of the biggest problems we have is because we're only ever thinking about ourselves. Believe in yourself, such a small thing to believe in. Some would say, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, I I let the universe speak to me. There's this talk about the universe. And I do believe that the universe does speak. The trees speak, the hills speak, animals speak to us. But to limit our hearing and listening to the universe is such a small thing to limit it to. Why pray to the universe when you can pray to the God of the universe? When you can pray to the Creator of the universe? Why listen to the mountains? Why listen to the sea? Why listen to the trees? Why listen to the sun rising or the sun setting when you can listen to the One who actually created all of those things, who said, let there be and there was. The sun is a magnificent piece of the universe. I get it. Anyone who follows me on Instagram would see every other day I post a photo of the sun setting. I love it but I never give praise to the universe. I often put a caption, my dad did that. It it was God in heaven who created the sun and the moon and the stars and the trees. And we get an opportunity to talk to Him, to limit our prayers to the universe. Such a small prayer. To believe in yourself, such a small thing to believe in. But in order for us to truly do what we're talking about, we have to humble ourselves. And prayer humbles us to acknowledge that there is someone bigger than us. If you're waiting to understand all there is to know about God before you believe in Him, that's not the kind of God you wanna give your life to. If you can understand God and every nuance of Him, you don't wanna give your life to that God. That's too small. 
You want to give your life to a God that is so big, so lofty, so strong, so wise that you can't fathom Him out. I mean, this God who creates Mount Everest, this massive mountain, but then the ant, really? Why? And why spiders? I I don't have answers for you on some of that stuff. But I'm happy to say and happy to give and happy to talk to a God who is bigger than me, who understands things far better than I do. You know, when you just believe in yourself and when you just trust yourself, it actually brings bondage. It doesn't bring freedom, just doing what you want to do and being what you want to be. I I remember seeing a cartoon skit of Thomas the Tank Engine and there he was off the rails and on his side. And the caption said, I'm free, I'm free. (laughs) Free to do what? Sit there on your side. Sometimes it's better to stay in the rails and move forward. This is the straight and narrow path that we get to walk. And in that straight and narrow path, there is freedom and there is joy and there is hope and there is peace. It takes a measure of humility for us to truly pray. Are you with me? You know, Bishop Taylor Smith, a former chaplain general of the forces, had a conversation with a young man And he said to the young man, when you look at the cross, what do you see? And the young man said, I see Jesus and I see a thief either side of him. And this chaplain looks at him and says, what else do you see? And he says, I I see soldiers gambling and guarding the cross of Jesus. And Bishop Taylor Smith said, if that's all you see, you're gonna struggle with your Christian walk. And then he looked at this young man and he said, I'll tell you what I see. When I see the cross, I see old Bishop Taylor Smith being crucified with him. If we're going to take our prayer to another level, we need to see that there but for the grace of God go each and every one of us. Every person in this room today is a privileged person. No matter how tough your week may be or your circumstances or situations may be that you're facing right now, you are still far better off than 95% of the planet. And when we forget that and we start thinking we're better than other people, it hinders our prayer. When we start thinking we're doing okay, that's when prayer stops. But if we could adopt the attitude of this chaplain and look at the cross of Christ and not just see Jesus, and not just see two thieves to his right and to his left, but we can always and forever see us crucified for all of our dumb, crazy, sinful things that we've done. None of us deserving his grace, but because we've been crucified with him, we get to stand before our Father in heaven with great confidence and assurance. Amen. Amen. Secondly, Prayer submits to God's plan. See, prayer is not asking God to approve and resource our plan. It's not getting God to sign off on all the things that we want. Prayer is giving God a blank piece of paper with our signature on it and letting God fill in the blanks. It's letting God fill in the blanks that we've already agreed to. 
This is why for me, when it comes to church attendance and certain disciplines like financial giving and serving in church, it's, it's, it's a no brainer for me because I signed my life away when I gave my life to Jesus. And it's not about the fact that I'm a pastor that I encourage people to come to church. It's not because I'm a pastor I'd encourage you to get involved and serve. It's not because I'm a pastor I'd say, you know, this is why we should tithe. But as a Christian, before I was a pastor, I understood these things. Because that's what prayer is. It's to submit to God's plan. It's us saying, God, Your will be done, not mine. It's Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when the heat was on and He was sweating droplets of blood and His disciples had all fallen asleep and He's thinking, what's the point? Imagine Jesus looking back at His disciples saying, people, God, surely there's got to be a better way. And you know what, even if there's not, is it worth it? They can't even stay awake for one hour. Bible records that Jesus could have called 12 legions of angels to come, that He might take His rightful place as King on earth. But He didn't. He understood that prayer is to submit to God's plan. He said, yet not my will, but yours be done. Jesus was arrested, crucified, and on the cross, as He was hanging there, people said, you who say you can save others, why don't you come off the cross and save yourself? And He could have done that. But in so saving Himself, He wouldn't have been able to save us. So He stayed there and obeyed the Father for the sake of others. See, you don't have to come to church, but it's not just about you. You don't have to give, but it's not just about you. You don't have to volunteer, but it's not just about you. Our heart and soul coming up is an opportunity for us to say thank you to all the incredible volunteers that make life who she is. And we wanna celebrate that. We wanna thank you. We wanna encourage you. We wanna bless you. We wanna envision you. We wanna empower you. We wanna pray for you. Why do you go to heart and soul? For those reasons. Because we understand it can get tough when you've signed your life away and you don't quite know what you're signing your life away to. That's the Christian life. Prayer submits to God's plan. Thirdly, prayer rests in God's provision. See, prayer requires faith. I love what it says in Hebrews 11 verse 6, without faith, it's impossible to please God. I know I've said this many times before, but when we come to pray, we need faith in our prayers, much like an iron needs heat in the iron. Do you know, if you iron without heat in the iron, you can iron all day long but it'll never get rid of the wrinkles. You need heat in the iron. It's not just the act of ironing, it's the heat in the iron. And when it comes to our prayers, it's not just the act of praying, our Father right in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, earth is in heaven, give us today's only bread, amen. I imagine kind of, what what was that? I imagine saying, what's he saying? Is he mumbling? What's what's he, what, what is that? It's not just an act. It's got to be coupled with faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, it says, And my God will meet all our needs according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. See, prayer is not something that's spoken out in panic. It's spoken in trust and rest. Knowing that He will meet all of our needs according to His riches. In other words, God's got this. And because God's got it, He's got you. So you don't got it. God's got it. But because God's got it and He's got you, it's all good. good. And He'll supply all of our needs. Can I just explain that for a moment? Because some of you said, I've prayed and God didn't give me what I asked for. 
I didn't say He'll provide everything you want. In actual fact, I hope every one of you lives long enough to learn to appreciate God's no. If you're not there yet, hang around. Because I'm so glad that God never answered all my prayers. Okay, Tony. I'm glad God said no to many of my prayers. And I, and I live as a beneficiary. I've been around long enough to say, oh my gosh, I'm so glad God didn't say yes to that. Yeah. Anyone else feel that way? Yeah. It's like, I'm so glad God didn't say yes to all of my prayers. But I do believe He'll provide everything we need. Yeah. The trouble is we don't always know what we need. God does. Yeah. We know what we want. We know what we desire. We know what we think we deserve. Yeah. But God knows what we need. And I would say, having been a Christian for many, many years, having preached messages like this for many, many years, having prayed for many, many years, God's always met my needs. But they didn't always look like I thought they were going to look. That's the thing. Sometimes I'd be praying for a financial breakthrough and I never got it. But God gave me peace not to worry. And you know what? That's a far better lesson to learn. And I have found God has always answered all of my prayers. It just didn't look the way I thought it would look. Can we get the band to come up as we close out this point number four? Prayer commits to God's work. See, prayer requires action. James chapter 2, verse 18 says, But some will say, You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You believe God? You believe in God? Well, that doesn't even differentiate you being a Christian or a demon, just believing in God. The question is, are we submitted to God? Are we surrendered to God? Are we going to serve Him? And this is where prayer comes in because prayer is an opportunity and an invitation to tap into the supernatural power and provision of God. It empowers us to play our part. Do you know there's lots in the Bible I don't like? There's lots in the Bible I find really tough to do. And there's some things in the Bible I find impossible to put into practice. And that's where prayer comes in. It gives me an opportunity to express exactly those thoughts to God. It gives me an opportunity to cry out to God for help. It gives an opportunity, an invitation for Him to empower me to do what I can't do in my own strength, to play my part. See, prayer acknowledges that between the already and the not yet, there's work to be done. And because there's work to be done, God is looking for men and women to put their hand to the plough as it were and to play their part. And we're not gonna be able to do that church without prayer. Prayer is not a religious ritual that we do. It's a lifeline. No relationship can work without talking, without communicating. Prayer is us talking and communicating to God and it's God communicating to us. There's times we speak to Him and there's times He speaks to us. And without that, our Christianity is not going to stand. We won't stand the test of time unless we pray. I know I'm a practical guy. I know my presentation Sunday by Sunday by Sunday is pretty earthy. It's pretty practical. And I don't apologise for that because I want to inspire people to put the Word of God into practice. But do not kid yourself for one moment that I stand up here in my own strength. 
Do not kid yourself for one moment that the practicality of what I'm asking us to embrace can be done in our own strength. Do not think for one moment that the simple teachings and the practicality of those simple teachings can be put into practice by yourselves. It takes a daily surrender. It takes a daily humbling of ourselves. It takes a daily crying out to Him. It takes daily prayer. It takes daily crying out to Him and relying on Him. Prayer for me is a desperation and a dependency on Him. And if we're not dependent or desperate, we have to ask ourselves, are we truly following Him? This is a year of come, follow me. And we can't follow Him without prayer. Prayer is a lifeline. Prayer is a privilege. We get to talk to God Almighty. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, imagine your hero, whoever that is on planet Earth, that person you most admire. You ever play that game? If you get a 15 minutes with someone, who would it be? And what would you say? Oh, you'd be so enamoured that they would give you a little bit of their time. But God of the universe wants to give us every day. Yeah. Every day. Yeah. I mean, I'd be fascinated and I'd appreciate 15 minutes with Arnold Schwarzenegger. I think that'd be a great interview, a great time. I'd love to spend some time with Tom Cruise. I think that'd be a pretty cool time. But I get to spend it with God. Yeah. And He's not on the clock. He wants to spend time with me. If I did get my 15 minutes with those guys, it'd be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I imagine it'd be like, yeah, 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 here's another one, next. But God's like, yeah, can we, yeah, uh-huh. Wow. Wow. If you, if, if you haven't sensed that from God, or maybe you have, but you haven't sensed it for a long time, that's why this message is a reminder to us to pray. 